Greetings, everyone. We're just waiting for all of our participants to join the Zoom webinar today, and we will get started in just a minute or so. We have a little over 900 people who registered, so we've got a lot of people to, to fill in the webinar participant list. For those of you who just joined us, we're just waiting for everyone to join. We've got a little over 900 people who registered. There's about 500 people who've joined us so far. So we're just waiting for um, some more to join. And then we'll go ahead and get the webinar started. So let's go ahead and get started before we make everyone wait too long. Hello, I'm Laura Rich, the Vice President of Outreach and Education for the AIA. And in the second installment of Archaeology Abridged, I'm delighted to introduce my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Patrick Hunt. Dr. Hunt is an award-winning archaeologist, author, and National Geographic grantee. He earned his PhD in archaeology from the Institute of Archaeology, United University College London and has taught at Stanford University for 25 years. He directed the Stanford Alpine Archaeology Project from 1994 to 2012 and has continued project related field work in the re region in the years since. I actually got to do it with him and maybe that's why I can't read this morning. His Alps research has been sponsored by the National Geographic Society's Expeditions Council. Patrick frequently lectures for National Geographic and others on Hannibal and Utsi the Iceman. He's a national lecturer for us here at the AIA, as well as an elected fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. Dr. Hunt has a lifelong love of the Alps, having lived for several months in the Alps annually since 1994, when not in the classroom or on the lecture circuit. He is the president of the Stanford chapter of AIA and has been a member of AIA since graduate school in 1984. A regular study leader on our educational tours, he led an AIA tour of Northern Italy in 2017 and 18, with another one scheduled in 2021. So if you're ready to take a tour, I highly recommend it. We are excited to be able to offer this lecture as part of a free series. However, as a nonprofit, the AIA relies on the generosity of supporters like you. If you would like to support AIA initiatives like Archaeology Abridged, we encourage you to donate using the number provided in the chat box. We truly appreciate your support. And Patrick, share some archaeology magic with us. Thank you, Laura, for the fun introduction. And Laura, uh, who excavated with us in the Hannibal Expedition uh, Archaeology Project for several years, I must say, uh, uh, Laura is just about the best trowel you're ever going to meet. Uh, she is amazing, fast, but accurate. And uh, she uh, is every archaeologist's dream as an archaeologist herself to have someone so competent in the trenches. So thank you, Laura. And 
I'm excited. I'm going to go ahead and move to the share screen mode since I have a lot of images to share. Um, so if we can go to this. There. Uh, you can just see uh, our AIA uh, logo and title here. Uh, it is such an honor and a privilege to be able to be part of the AIA. And I'm grateful to uh, each uh, 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 basically decade of officers. And uh, it, we have phenomenal leadership, visionary leadership, responsible integrity. And uh, President Leticia LaFollette, uh, and also some of the vice presidents like Laura and director uh, of development, uh, Liz and Rebecca King, executive director. Thank you all uh, for being so encouraging by allowing uh, us to, who work in the field, share what we love. And I'm passionate about this material. Uh, as you can see, uh, Utsi the Iceman uh, is uh, an incredible story, you probably know many of the details, and I'm not going to tell the full story today because we really only have 30 plus minutes. Uh, this is one of the images I start with. You can see our, since I also work for National Geographic, you can see kind of our National Geographic logo there, uh, the yellow box, uh, and you can see a, a model of, uh, of Utsi, uh, sort of a modern uh, person, uh, you know, imitating him as surrogate. You can see the place where he was found in the Cimillon Pass and the Utztal Alps. And uh, as mentioned by Laura, we had the National Geographic Expedition Council, uh, Hannibal Expeditions. We've had quite a few uh, trips uh, to also Bolzano to the museum there where Utsi is, the South Tyrol Museum. And uh, it's worth noting that my two basic projects that I do for National Geographic are Utsi and Hannibal. And I have this interest in Utsi, which is very medically related because I'm also at the Institute for Ethnomedicine, uh, this title, too many letters to put into a caption, really, archaeoethnobotanist. Uh, but that means I study ancient plants and Utsi carried uh, a, a huge array of plant medicines. Uh, this was a time when, as you know, 5,000 years ago, pre-literate, prehistoric between the Neolithic and the Copper Age, people weren't writing things down. So we have to wonder, given uh, all of Utsi's kit, and I'll come back to this question, how much uh, he knew uh, and how much we've lost in the interim. Yes, we've gained, but there's a tremendous sense of prehistoric medicine uh, that uh, is kind of hidden behind Utsi. He's a one-off, so we can't, we can't share this as systemic or cultural if he's the only person we have to show this. And I must say uh, with Utsi too, remember that Organic material doesn't generally survive the thousands of years. Yes, we can find skeleton, but we've got with Utsi nearly everything, 99% plus of Utsi has been preserved because he was frozen in time, literally in a glacier for the 5,000 years. So that means we have some of his hair. We have, we can tell the color of his eyes, uh, what he ate, his last meals, what he digested in the previous meals, the environments he walked through, they leave their traces, the pollens on him. It is just amazing. He's a, I would say uh, that if you're going to say one of the most important archaeology discoveries of all time, Utsi has to be right up there. In a Penguin book I wrote some years back about 10 discoveries that wrote history, uh, I didn't include Utsi, but if I ever, ever do a sequel, I will. Uh, one of the most incredible things to remember uh, the past by Utsi. So now, uh, as I said, this is the other uh, par part of my National Geographic project. And Laura has been with me, Laura Rich, who introduced me, has been with me on several of these expeditions tracking Hannibal from uh, Carthage, Spain, uh, France, Italy, through the Alps. We, we've tracked his pathway through the Alps down in, into the rest of uh, the Mediterranean. So uh, these are things that are very near and dear to my heart. So I am writing a book on Utsi to follow this book on Hannibal. Uh, now, let's quickly look at the Northern European Alpine terrain and passage. You can see a topographic satellite map here. And for thousands of years, even in the Paleolithic, people were going through the Brenner Pass right here, which is only 6,000 feet high. You know, so you've got trees right up to the summit of the pass. A tree line is maybe a thousand feet above that. So people have used this uh, in the Neolithic as well, the Mesolithic. Uh, during the ice ages, of course, it was not uh, something that you could cross. 
Uh, but between the ice ages and after the ice ages, about 11,000 years ago, the last, the younger driest period when the ice, uh, ice and the glaciers receded, this pass was opened up again, Mesolithic onward. And this is the normal pass. This is the one that you would take if you're going by train from Innsbruck uh, to, to Milan. Uh, but that's not where Utsi was found. Utsi was found over here in the top of these daunting mountains. Uh, not at 6,000 feet, but at 10 and a half thousand feet, literally in a glacier. Uh, and there, it's not an easy pathway. I've been up there, I've, I've hiked, I've seen how difficult, it's easier from the Austrian side in the north, you can see the Utztal Valley coming up, but how he gets there, and he probably lives down uh, much closer down here, we'll see, uh, we know where he lived for some time. Uh, he's coming up probably from the south uh, east, into these mountains and why is a big question. There are many questions, too many to answer today. I'd be much more interested in answering just looking at the medical material today. But you know, we know uh, Utsi died not voluntarily, not accidentally, he was murdered uh, and uh, it was a homicide. So we've done four Na National Geographic Nova movies about him. Uh, the first one was Death of the Iceman that we did in 99. Then we did uh, uh, the Iceman murder mystery uh, in, in 2010, 11, then we did the Iceman Reborn uh, a few years ago, and then we just did the new one, the science one last year. So this is something that National Graphic Nova uh, is very keen on, and uh, AIA is equally partner uh, with this because for several years I've been lecturing on UTSI around the country, in fact, internationally uh, in, in Canada, elsewhere, with this topic. So it's a, it's a really important topic to me. So here's where Utsi was found uh, in 1991, two hikers, Helmut and Erika Simon from Germany, they came up from Austria from the German speaking side. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how they, uh, how they made their decisions and what they found. This is what Utsi looks like today in the lab. Uh, literally, he's frozen, he has to be kept, uh, you know, sub frozen temperatures, so sub, he has to be in a frozen environment aided with uh, uh, basically cryogenic uh, lab environment because we don't want him to decompose. That's really important. Uh, so he's kept very, very cold. And every 18 months or so, he's brought out and a whole cadre of scientists descend on him. And unfortunately, he's been picked and pried and, uh, uh, and you know, diced and sliced, uh, but uh, we're slowing down a lot of that. And I'm just a minor player in this. I'm not a, a PI, a principal investigator, but I am involved. And uh, you can see some of this forensic team. It's a huge array of, of scientists, skin doctors, bone doctors, et cetera, people who look at pollen, palynologists, paleobotanists, radiologists, stone uh, specialists, epidemiologists, endocrinologists, et cetera, et cetera, archaeologists, generally speaking. And I work in the pathology and the archaeobotany side. So everybody wants to get in on Utsi for that. However, 20 minutes he's brought out of the freezer. Uh, and you have this huge research agenda, and then he has to go back in again for the next 18 months. That little window of time, 20 minutes when he's out of the freezer, he, you can already see he's starting to, to you know, melt, and that's not good. We wanna preserve him for as much as possible. Uh, that's just part of the last film we did at the Cold Springs Harbor DNA Lab last year, last uh, uh, April, May. Uh, and uh, we're looking at the replica that Gary Staub made, uh, but it's perfect, it is really, I would say 99.5% re replica accurate uh, as a rosin uh, material. It's, it's, and I hands off to Gary for making such a faithful rub because even the tattoos are visible. Uh, and here's where Utsi was found at first uh, because the, 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 the family uh, that found him uh, thought that he was uh, in, in Austria. They went down and called in the next village down when they descended, they called the Austrian authorities to get the corner in Innsbruck. So it was the Austrians who came up first. Technically, he was actually in Italy and the Italians knew this, but Utsi went to Austria for uh, practically uh, a decade. And eventually uh, GPS coordinates were shown that he was actually from Italy and they repurposed the South Tyrol Archaeology Museum in Bolzano for him. And so that's where he resides today. So 10 and a half thousand feet it kind of settled an international dispute. It, was, it could have gone to the Hague International Court if it, things had got out of hand, but the Austrians were very gracious about it. And, and now he's back in Italy. Uh, you can see uh, that on a typical 
uh, late summer day with the ice melting and more and more, by the way, it is really regressing. This is one of the projects I work on with glacial regression in archeology span uh, for National Geographic. Utsi was exposed. And for anybody who wants uh, evidence of climate change and global warming, this is a really good one because he was not exposed for 5,000 years. He was literally in a glacier. And the fact that uh, the, the glacier preserved him so well, had he been in a warming period, he would have started to decompose. Uh, and so we know that he was frozen for that whole period of time. So please take note, global warming is real. We've watched 25% glacial regression in the last few decades in the Alps. It's really sad. And that's all over the place, uh, not just in Switzerland and the Alps. But here's where he was found right here. And there's a refuge, a hut, a huta right there. And the, uh, the, the, the family, of course, went over here first, the husband and wife. Helmut and uh, Eric, Eric, but then they, they went back down to Austria. And this is what it looks like looking south into Italy with uh, the Vernago Lake. This would be basically during the winter. This is what he looked like when they found him. Uh, the Simons uh, didn't know, they, they recognized that it was a body. They thought it might have been a recently deceased person. They weren't sure. They took photos. They, they, they weren't sure if somebody else had seen him before they did. It's possible. They tried tugging him out of the ice. But in the late afternoon, there was a puddle of water because the ice melted a bit, but he was too deeply frozen below. Uh, and they shouldn't have probably touched him. They probably knocked his hair off. Now, he'd been in that gully where the ice was for the 5,000 years. He rocked a little bit in those 5,000 years, but now the ice had melted, exposed him, and uh, they probably pulled some of his clothes off too. He looks a little bit like an alien here, doesn't he? Uh, but he is a human being, and you have to call the coroner if you find a body. That was a given. They, they were responsible in that way. Uh, this is a different picture, uh, an early morning picture when the ice is frozen again the next day or so. But uh, it took a, a couple days for the Austrians to come up with a helicopter in bad weather. And you can see uh, here, they've pried him out of the ice and he looks pretty emaciated. That's, you know, you, you could say freezer burn if you wish. All the material with him, his clothes, his tools have all been left around him and down in the, in the pool of water and had to eventually archeologically be removed. But what they found when they dragged a bunch of this stuff out, and they had some plastic bags, they stuck in the plastic bags and they dragged it all back to Innsbruck, put him on a lab in, in the mortuary uh, and, and looked and they then realized what? This isn't a recent deceased person. This is a stone ax. They're stone flint arrowheads. They realized this guy had been there for a long time. And you know, that's why archaeology got involved fairly quickly, but it took months in between seasons to, to get everything out. Hundreds of artifacts. So we have a much better picture. But look at this picture here. Look at the helicopter pilot and the coroner uh, carrying him. Well, first, you know, you can say, what did he die of? You know. Well, not like the cat out of curiosity. He was, he was killed, but they didn't know that at the time. Now, here's a picture showing the mountain rescue team, the helicopter pilot on the left, uh, I'm on the right and the corner on the left. What's wrong with this picture? Contamination, DNA, they're barehanded. They shouldn't be doing this like this, but they did anyway. Yes, he does have a bit of contaminated DNA relic on him. Now, this is my photo looking south from the, uh, the Inn River towards the Ustal Alps. You saw some of the pictures on the top and looking north, but here it is from the south. I'll show you other pictures. And this is the easiest way. If you want to cross into Austria or whatever it was called at the time, we have no idea. Uh, this would be the, the route, but it's a very high route and a formidable one, daunting one. Now, in the museum in Bolzano, you can see National Graphic has put a lot of uh, research and time and money into it. So you would walk into the museum and see National Graphic logo uh, there for a while as a sponsor partner. That's my photo looking now north when we were filming. You can see how much the snow, in June, this should be covered with snow. And in 2011, you can see just little patches of snow and that's the 10,000 foot level right there. Uh, so, uh, it is very much a climate change context. Uh, and Utsi is just one. There could be lots of these that we are finding more and more, including Viking materials up in Norway. Uh, 
there have been some leather shoes found uh, in the Bernice Ober Alps that are Roman. All kinds of things are being exposed now with the glaciers melting. So he was covered for 5,000 years. What, what more can we need to say about that? Now, here's a map showing that down here in Italy, the Adige River Valley, there's a, a castle here, the Juval site, where he probably lived. And he went up the Sinalis Valley up here. This is where he was found. Now, we don't know. We're pretty sure this is the route he took from where he lived. This is the most ostensible place where he lived. And you can see the overall picture here. But we're not sure if he went up and then back down and back up again. But we know that he did go from basically deciduous trees to through coniferous trees to no trees and then back down again all the way to deciduous and then back up again. He went up, down, up. And I'll talk more about that. We do have this on the, on the record. And how do we know this? Now you can see the topography, the contours here are really, really steep. Uh, if you look at this, uh, uh, the 10 meter contour lines. This is so steep. Uh, how he came up would not be directly from Lake Vernago. He would have come up along the valley and a transverse. And he passed through a lot of vegetation zones. Here's just another close up of the fine spot. So he didn't go, as far as we know, up, down, up necessarily. He could have gone up and then down into Austria and then come back up. Uh, but there are different plant habitats today, so we can't prove that. Now, this is the castle. Uh, Rudolf Meissner, the alpinologist and climber, uh, owns that castle. There was a Neolithic site there and a Copper Age site. They found smelting sites for copper here. This is the closest place. There's what it looks like above the Adige Valley. Uh, there's my photo of it recently. And this is a picture I took of the road going up. It's both medieval, but it's much, much older. You can see my little meter stick there measuring. Uh, and uh, this is probably the Neolithic and Copper Age uh, road too, uh, with stone cobbles added in. This is what it looks like much higher up, it, probably the route he came. That castle's out of sight below here. You're going through mixed coniferous and deciduous zone by this point. So uh, deciduous leaves that drop, their, their, the trees drop their leaves in the fall, coniferous uh, needles, you see the, the habitat change uh, and you're kind of in that transition zone. And this is the tree that he had a lot of pollen from this tree found on his clothes in pockets. This is the hornbeam, the carpinetus. And in his, in his clothes, uh, you have these places where there were creases and also in his esophagus and, and parts of his mouth, there was so much pollen that tells us he probably died in late spring. You know how pollen covers your cars in spring? Well, he was covered in pollen, but not all of it has been preserved, just in pockets. And interestingly, it's, it's layered. So you have uh, hornbeam. First, you have much lower deciduous pollen, like maples. Then you have this hornbeam pollen, about a third of the way up. Then you have fir pollen, abiase pollen, then you have no pollen, and then it reverses. The layers reverse, and then in some cases they even reverse back up again. So we know he went 10,000 vertical feet three times in about 36 hours. Uh, and uh, we can tell by the, dis the, the digestion inside him uh, how long this took, the process, uh, because it's also in his food. And you know, you look at pollen, pollen, when you do geoarchaeology, as I've done, under a microscope, you can definitely speciate trees by their pollen. So we have, see the, we see the fir pollen, the carbonatus pollen, and other pollens with him in these environments. That's evidence that he literally traveled 30,000 feet in 36 hours. Now, uh, if I climb 10,000 feet in a day, I'm pretty proud of myself. But this guy seemed to have been doing it uh, not voluntarily. He was possibly a fugitive. That's our premise. So he had to do it. He was possibly being chased. Now you can see the, the deciduous zones down here, coniferous mixed zones, and then you way get up above the snow line to no pollen whatsoever, even above the lichens. And this zigzaggy lozengy bit here is because of human, what we call anthro, uh, you know, uh, basically anthropogenic change. The forests are not like they used to be. Now here's the fine spot showing distribution of some of his materials over 10 square meters, but this took months to get it all together. Hundreds of objects in that little gully at the top of the pass under a glacier. Uh, and now teeth, these are just a dental specimen. These aren't his teeth, but you can actually tell where someone was born by the strontium ratios in their teeth. This is a known chemistry signature. Uh, so we know he was born in the Asarco River Valley, uh, uh, just east of Bolzano, 
about 35 kilometers from, from basically uh, the Juval Castle place where he was living apparently. And we, we know in this Copper Age site, copper is being the new metal developed. Uh, it's the, the first real metal in the metallur metallurgy that we call after the, the Neolithic revolution, copper starts uh, being with tin in the Bronze Age as an alloy, but this is before that, it's just pure copper, arsenical copper. But here in his teeth, or the teeth that, that are good specimens, we can tell where someone was born because the water that you drink permeates the enamel of your teeth and the, those ratios are there lifelong. If you didn't move around a lot, if you're five years in the same place in your first uh, years, this is gonna show in your teeth. So we can identify his, his uh, birth spot. So again, he was born east of here. And uh, this is that Copper Age castle place. Uh, where copper was being moved around. There's a literally a copper route in the late Neolithic, early Copper Age. So they're bringing copper through here and then the, they're apparently melting it here, melting the ore. And here are different forms of copper uh, that they were beginning to exploit. Native copper nuggets that oxidize green and you can see malachite, azurite, chrysocle and so on. And by 500 years after the fact, you know, you've got these Copper Age mining sites all over the place, but he's one of the first now in his hair, the hair that was found with him and had to be put back together, showing on the hair, uh, the, the, the basically hair had copper particles all over it. And the copper particles, it's arsenical copper, so 97% copper, two and a half percent arsenic with a little silver. This is the, the exact ratio of what we find in the ax he also was carrying with him, this copper ax, the first pioneering copper ax that's carried with him that wasn't taken when he was killed. So copper particles in his hair tell us that he, he was in a spot where copper was being melted uh, in a closed uh, environment uh, where they raised the temperature with bellows. And so copper was literally volatilized into his hair. So he was somehow associated with copper mining and or copper exploitation. So copper particles in his hair. Neither of these pictures are copper in the hair. They're just biological specimen pictures. Now you look where he was found, right here, found between two very distinct cultures, the Thessalio Danubian branch in the north of the Alps and the Mediterranean branch in the south. And he's strictly found in no man's land between the two. That could be telling. It's an international boundary today where he was found between Italy and Austria, but it was probably a cultural boundary then to 5,000 years ago. Now, when we did with one of the first uh, movies, we were looking at all his tools. And one of the things we found with his tools, uh, he has two types of woods in his tools. And his arrow shafts are Cornell wood or viburnum. And I cut this long straight piece of viburnum from my garden this morning. It re really makes good arrows uh, when it dries out. Uh, so he, he literally had Cornell and viburnum arrows. And Virgil and the Georgics, you know, basically 3,000 years after Utsi says, Cornell is a great wood for arrow shafts. So that tradition was known for thousands of years. What was interesting about the fletching, the feathers on those arrows, uh, the ends, the fletching was done in a spiral, which means if you shoot the arrow out of the bow, it automatically starts to spiral. It's like throwing a spiral football. It gives you accuracy, it improves your trajectory, it gives you better velocity, speed, less drag with air resistance vector. So, they knew this aerodynamics 5,000 years ago. Astonishing. What else did they know? Well, let's get to the medical bit. Uh, here you could just see some of the arrows. Now, the guy that we had for the film Sorgat walking around in the Alps, that's pretty dangerous, scary vertical uh, sp spots. I, I can tell you from experience, having broken both legs in, in the Alps, that this, you can be dizzy up here and Utsi had some medical problems. And so this would be really dangerous for him unless he had some kind of medical offset. This is what we thought he looked like in 94. This is sort of the model of a modern person. And by the way, Utsi was only 45 years old, but looked 70. He had accelerated aging, but you can expect that with lower longevity 5,000 years ago, that he looked older than we would today. Now, this guy looks pretty buff for a, you know, a, 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 a basically a, a vintage citizen. Utsi was not that buff. In fact, his hands were not calloused at all. His upper body was not strong. His legs looked pretty muscled, but his upper body looked more like he was a clerk uh, or maybe he was high status. Maybe he was a headman, we don't know. These are the tools, pictures of the tools that I took. He had a broken dagger tip, that's flint. 
uh, uh, this is his copper ax. These are his shoes, what's left, and part of his goat skin and, and other animal remains that he had as a cape. And by the way, these shoes are amazing. They're grass and moss and then uh, cords with bear skin over it. And they, he had he had bear skin, and that's really a good material because bear skin, when you turn it over with the fur on the inside, there's so much fat in bear skin that it's water impermeable. So some Italian shoe companies making these shoes now. They're great for hiking. I've tried one on, and they're pretty supple, and you will keep your feet dry. Amazing. All right. Now this is Dr. Annalisa Pedrati and I who were looking at his X-rays uh, in Bolzano, and you look closely. His bone cells were much older than they should have been. He had accelerated aging uh, and the blood flow, the marrow production was low, which is not a good sign, but he also had very bad arthritis in his knees. Uh, and he had a type of arthritis that's not normal. We'll get to that. Uh, his knees, he was bone on bone, literally on his knees. So he had scraped away uh, the cartilage. There was very little cartilage left and it would have been very painful for him to walk. So how did he do? Plus, you know, how did he do? 30,000 vertical feet in, in 36 hours. Plus he had claw toe or hammer toe. His toes were basically, uh, uh, because of arthritis and other problems, it would have been hard and painful for him to walk. Now, he had, we know now, 62 tattoos on his body. And they're not clan markings. What's interesting about all these tattoos, they were over joints. Uh, there's only one tattoo that's not over a joint. Even the most recent one found was over a broken rib. And that tells you something. Why over joints? This is a bit hypothetical, but uh, we know uh, from a lot of modern medicine that carbon dioxide is one of the painkillers. And it's possible that the tattoos, he, they were not done at the same time. The tattoos in his body were done over a period of years. Every one was over a joint and over a rib, might except for one. And look at the back vertebrae here with tattoos along them. And the elbow also had a tattoo, his ankles, his shoulders, all these tattoos. If you take crushed uh, carbon, charcoal, and you cut and then insert it in there, it could be potentially effective for some time if there's a, if there's a reaction with the carbon, oxidation, oxidation of the carbon to produce carbon dioxide. It's just a hypothesis. We don't know, but there's a lot of medical uh, science that tells us today carbon dioxide is a known pain. They're even using hydrotherapy with carbon, carbon dioxide bubbles in spas now uh, for this. So moving away from the tattoos, he carried two types of fungus with him. And you can see uh, one of them is to st start a fire with, and he had pyrite pieces to get sparks. Uh, but the, but the, one, the tinder fungus, Al Alpiners and ostrich today even wear these caps made with uh, this fungus uh, around it. They're, they're basically like felt, fungus felt. But the other one's really important. Uh, uh, the, the top one, this is purposeful. This is not accidental. It's, you see it's on a thong. So he carried this with him. And what is this? It's a bracket fungus that grows out of a tree trunk. That's not a mushroom. It looks like a basidium, but it grows into the tree and the mycelia grow into the, the bark. Uh, but he carried this with him. Why? Here's what it looks like on a perch tree. This is called the Formatopsis betulinus, the birch polypore. Now, this is an amazing uh, fungus. We, we, we know that polypores, here I'm showing you one. This is Ganoderm. This is the famous one in Asia that gives you its uh, Ling Shi, or uh, it, it's the one that's called the, the fungus for immortality. It's a bracket fungus, and it's very good antibacterial. You can make tea with it. Uh, it's shiny, gano, so sk shiny skin, ganodermis. People were eating these, but Utsi was doing this medically because we also know it literally was a vermifuge. It was killing a whipworm in him. The eggs, it, they can't tolerate when you ingest this. And he was literally, he had this in his stomach as well as carrying it with him. And what we know about it now, we know Utsi had Lyme disease. And pipt the piptamine in the fungus is an antibiotic, it's also antiviral, and it really stops both E. coli and other things, and it's extremely effective against Borreliosis, against the Lyme disease. So eating this inhibited some of the Lyme disease problems, which you can include with Lyme disease, polyneuropathy, encephalitis, so brain fevers, Lyme arthritis, which he had, vertigo, etc. So you can imagine Utsi had some big medical needs. 
uh, I'm going through this very fast and I'm already running out of time, but this was carried for multiple purposes, antibiotic, antiviral, anti-Lyme disease, and against the worms as a vermifuge. Uh, so multiple purposes, it's not a panacea, but this is not something that was accidental that he was carrying. Now here's uh, uh, David who's with me, we're in the Hudson River Valley gathering some of these fungi from birch trees one of the last places where you walk into this forest in Hudson River, we did this for the film, and it says, beware, you're entering Lyme disease, tick infested area. So nature provided the tick, but also provided the antidote. Here's one growing in Canada. Now he also carried poppy seeds with him. That's a known, uh, as you know, analgesic. And uh, with the poppy seeds, uh, that would be the painkiller. Think of all the derivatives we have from poppies today. Uh, and he had 18 different types of wood products. He really knew his environment, sophisticated knowledge of his environment, uh, much better than we would today. All kinds of different woods, as I said here, ash, cornel, viburnum, larch. His backpack was made of larch and hazel, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, birch. Uh, now, one of the things that he had with him are slow berries. This is from the blackthorn. I've got some here. Uh, these are slow berries. Uh, you, if you, you, you can't probably see these very well, but these slow berries, he had one in his stomach and one was found with him. Look what they're good for. They're a metabolic st stimulant. They have vitamin C. They treat diarrhea, which he would have had with the worms, eczema, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, anti inflammatory, anti-carcinogenic. They improve his vision. They stop vertigo. This guy was also carrying these slow berries as a medicine from the blackthorn. Uh, this is what the ones I just showed you look like. Uh, they're only harvestable in September, but he was carrying them in May. So he, he'd been, someone had harvested these and they'd been six months with somebody drying out and they're still really potent and strong. So a metabolic aid for hiking that's going to also address some of his medical needs. You can just see the habitat has been like this for thousands of years. So now we may wonder if he went up then down into Austria and then came back. This would be maybe different hostile territory, but he was shot in the back. Now we didn't know this for 10 years. Uh, it was the CAT scans that proved here different bone density with our, you know, if you think of bone uh, as opposed to flint, very different bone density uh, between the, the uh, you know, the bone, the, the carbonate bone phosphate material as opposed to silica in the flint. So it really stood out the density so he was shot in the back. And what it did is it pierced his subcarotid artery and he hemorrhaged to death in five minutes internally. Here's the, the uh, inside him. Uh, it, it was shot in the back, went through the scapula, nicked that artery and he bled to death pretty quickly. That is not your Thanksgiving turkey. That's Utsi and shows a probe where the arrow went in through his back, through the scapula. He had amazing th stress lines in his fingers and he's also carrying sphagnum moss with him. Now sphagnum moss and necra moss, we know in World War I that it was put on wounds because it's, it's, it's acidity, uh, was low pH stops a lot of bacterial activity. Uh, he had necra moss in his hands. He was carrying this and he had wound hands, as, hands in his, uh, wounds in his hands as well. This, this is carried with him uh, as an antiseptic and a wound dressing. Now his fingers show a lot of stress. The fingernails show high stress in his life. But he had a lot of problems. You can just see his eye, which we can tell his eye color was brown. He had dental abscesses and caries. It's a lot of problems. He also had a, 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 what we call Heliobacter pylori, which is a, a, an invasive bacteria used with shepherds and goat herds. This is too early for domesticating cows, but they were beginning to domesticate goats up there. So he had this in his stomach lining that's recently been found. So he had a lot of problems. Look at all the problems he had. And yet the medical material that he carried with him addressed a lot of these issues. So Utsi knew the material to address his specific issues. And that, that is just phenomenal today when you look at all of his problems and how many things he was carrying were good for him. Uh, and uh, we, we would like to know if he carried some kind of honey, if there are sugar traces on him, if he was taking things like bee pollen as well, uh, vitamin B stimulants. It wouldn't surprise us. What else did his culture know? How much have we lost? Things weren't written down. It's, I, I'm going to suggest in the pandemic today, maybe we ought to explore piptamine in some of these bracket fungi to see, since they're antiviral, if maybe there's some possibilities there. Whatever, Utsi is a one-off, 
a, a medical phenomenon, someone who knew what his medical issues were, he would not have lasted much longer. Uh, he had you know, arteriosclerosis as well, but here he is carrying the medicine to address his needs. What a story this is. Now, he was shot in the back. Uh, he, as I said, we think he was a fugitive and he died pretty quickly. Uh, and then the, the snows buried him for the 5,000 years. And we know he died there on the spot because of the fibrin around the wound, which is only there when a wound is fresh and then it's frozen on him. So this is quite the story with Utsi, isn't it? 5,000 years buried in a glacier. Uh, and now what he can tell us about the past. What a treasure he is. And uh, th those in science and medicine, as an archeological scientist myself, uh, and someone interested in, in paleobotany and archeology span and ancient medicine, I find Utsi absolutely fascinating. How many more questions we have that we haven't asked yet? Thank you for letting me share a little bit of Utsi's story. Well, you may say there are a lot of questions, but our group has a lot of questions for you. So first, a, a very uh, quick one. What does the name Utsi mean? Well, it, we don't know what his name was, and I'm glad you uh, you mentioned that. Uh, I assume that our audience has some familiarity with Utsi, but it's a really good question uh, because Utsi is a nickname. You wouldn't believe the things he's been called. Frozen Fritz, the Similon man, because that's where he was found in that past. Utsi is just the diminutive for the Utztal Alps. So he's Utsi from the Utztal Alps, the fine spot. That's all it means. We have no clue what his name was. Nobody wrote things down. It wasn't a literate time. Thank you. Excellent question. What does the DNA testing reveal about his origins? Oh, well, I, I cut a lot of that short, but here's a DNA slide. Uh, you know, it tells us that he belongs to a very small haplogroup. Only 8% of the mitochondrial DNA in Europe shows haplogroup K. And there's K1 and K2, but he's K1. Uh, you see the umlaut O, because he's the only one who has that uh, that. DNA. So that tells us that there, there's no descendants of Utsi yet been found uh, in uh, Austria or the area of uh, this, the Tyrol, whatever. Uh, so also the male Y chromosome tells us it's a rare genetic mutation, but the farmers that, that beginning incipient agriculture, it's not easy there, but they were from originally the Caucasus. So the closest relatives our insular peoples like from the island of Sardinia who didn't get out and didn't intermix or from the Caucasus. We even have his blood cells. First, you know, we have the oldest undamaged blood cells from him. As I said, we know his, his, his eye color was brown. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting to look at that DNA record. Thank you for asking. There are people who share common ancestors, but it's 12,000 years back. Nobody in the current population of Austria uh, ha has this. So no known descendants, but really good question too. So Christina Emery asks, do the cavities indicate a high sugar diet? And if so, would this help indicate his social status? Interesting. Um, the abscesses and caries are not necessarily sugar related. They're from not flossing. <laughs> Listen to your dentist, you know, uh, meat uh, and things that, you know, rot in the teeth. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, there is some sugar trace around him, but not in the teeth. And that's why I wonder if it was honey related, because we know honey's antibacterial. Honey will last a long time. If he already knew the antibacterial properties of some of these other things like slow berries and the bracket fungus, could he also have known this about honey? The Egyptians knew it, but they didn't write it down until later. So yeah, cavities and caries from, you know, it sounds pretty nasty, aggressive problems uh, in uh, putrid meat rotting in his teeth. Yuck. Yeah, we won't end on that note. How about, <laughs> uh, Richard Zimmer asks, what was the string for the bow made out of? Hmm. Basically, uh, uh, we, we have different guts, uh, you know, animal gut and fiber. And that bow, I didn't talk about it, but I should. The bow was made of yew wood, taxus bucata. And yew wood is the strongest wood 
literally in the world for archery. The English longbowmen of the Hundred Years' War between, you know, basically 14th, 15th century uh, in England had yew bows. They could shoot 300 yards with those bows. His bow was yew. And, and I got some bows cut uh, from Filoli Estate for me, and we tried the tension strength on these bows, and the heartwood and the outer wood make a perfect complement for bows. Interestingly enough, Virgil in his Georgics also says the best wood for bows is yew wood. So gut strings and plant fibers mixed together, cords with a yew wood bow. Isn't that fascinating that, that people have known about yew bow as the best wood possible for 5,000 plus years? Amazing. So Elizabeth, and I'm going to mangle this name, Margoshes, has a wonderful uh, theory here that I love. She says, might he have been carrying all those medications as a healer who traveled yep. across borders and some patient was lost, so he was shot for lack of success. You know, it, that's a funny one. And we've, we've looked at that possible scenario. We don't know, was he a shaman? You know, this is the problem when you only have one survivor. We don't know how many people attacked him even. We don't know what they took, but they left the medical materials and they left his copper ax, which would be worth today on the market value like a brand new Lexus, you know, $50,000. That's how much that copper ax was. And they left it, why? Would it be too obvious you'd be spotted with his axe? We just don't know enough. But yes, it is very likely he could have been a shaman or a healer. Uh, you know, I have to throw a funny one in here. For a while, people thought he died, uh, uh, was murdered in the last 10 years or so as a, as a sex criminal because they thought he'd been castrated. But no, everything's there. It's just shrunk. It's desiccated by the weather. <laughs> So what, what, did he, what did he die of? Well, not like the cat curiosity, I don't think. <laughs> Mrs. Nixon's eighth grade class is watching and they want to know, did you feel like you were making history when you were researching Utsi? This is the neat thing. And Laura, you're part of this too, is this everybody here from the AIA, we're all archeologists and we always feel so, so fortunate and lucky to be on the cusp of discovery. And often we don't find what we're looking for, but we find something else even more exciting. And even though I wasn't part of the original find team, I am so excited to be part of the unraveling of the mystery of Utsi. And this is what the AIA is really all about. Uh, we, we want to bring history to life. We do believe to a certain degree that uh, because we understand a little of the past, it helps us understand a little bit more of the present, and maybe what can happen in the future, because history has cyclical repetitions. So I, I'm very, very lucky. I'm so fortunate to be trained in archaeology and to, to do what I love, like uh, all my colleagues here for the AIA. Uh, you know, it's to do a field science, combining history and science and archaeology is a privilege. And Mrs. Nixon's class, we're thrilled that you're with us today because you're the future. We want you to pick up the mantle and go with us to preserve the past. Uh, and uh, we have this responsibility to pass on uh, that, that fascination for ancient history to you. So thank you. And I may be coming to your class. Uh, I, I, Mrs. Nixon has that email. Well, Patrick, thank you. This was amazing. We want to thank you for your time and wisdom. If you enjoyed this lecture, we encourage you to donate either on our website, archaeological.org slash donate, or simply text donate to 833-965-2840, or even better, become a member of AIA and benefit from all our events and all that Patrick was talking about, opening this up to your family and friends. There's so much to learn and we're so grateful that Patrick shared his knowledge. We had a lot more questions we couldn't get to, but we are going to ask Patrick to share a bibliography and that will be emailed out to all participants so that you can do your own research into Utsi. Thank you for sharing your afternoon with AIA, and we hope you'll join us for our next talk. 
And a quick reminder that we'll also be emailing you a link to the recording of the video, which can be viewable later on the AIA website. What a pleasure. Thank you for participating with us.